Welcome to Community College News. I'm Jill Constantine. Today on our show, how one family is coping with the sudden loss of a full-time paycheck. And are video game ratings enough? But first, more people have been stealing food. Our Michael McDonald reports it's a sign of the tough economic times. There's a sign people in Woodstock are desperate. <laughs> Food thefts tripled last year, according to police. When I first heard of this incident, or these incidents and these numbers were, go were climbing so high, I was quite shocked. Um, I went immediately to our stats. Ogden Olmsted is surprised at the increase because more people have been accessing the food bank and no one has been turned away. You would think that the stigma of getting caught shoplifting and having to go to court would be quite a bit higher than the stigma that you'd have to deal with with coming to the food bank. One local grocer who suffered from thefts is still more than willing to help out those in need. I'd rather you come to me and say, look, you know, I'm having it tough, can you help me out? You know, can you help me on some prices or can you let me have some bread or what, you know, or whatever. Bradbury hasn't seen large thefts like the big chain stores. He's only caught people stealing small items. We, we had a young, young mother try to take some milk one day and, you know, to me, I, know, I felt it just makes you feel horrible, right? I mean, she has to, and I told her, look, there are programs for that. Despite Bradbury's experiences, he understands people's desperation, and he hopes the community can come together to solve this problem. In Woodstock, Michael McDonald, Community College News. Restaurants in downtown Fredericton are getting set to show off their unique cuisine. On top of that, they are raising money for children with diabetes. Brad Perry has more. The city of Fredericton is set to host the third annual Dine Around Freddy. The event celebrates fine cuisine while raising money for a local children's camp. David Seabrook says the event helps the restaurants during the slow season. It's an opportunity to showcase uh, some great culinary cuisine uh, uh, to uh, locals primarily, and those people become ambassadors when it hits tourism season. A total of 10 restaurants are participating in the event, with most of them located in the downtown core of Fredericton. The restaurants all offer a three-course meal at either $29 or $45. Part of the proceeds, so a dollar for each meal that's served at all of those restaurants, We'll go back to the Canadian Diabetes Association. All the money raised will go to Camp Diabest here at Camp Rotary, sponsored by the Diabetes Association. It gives children with diabetes a chance to come together to meet one another. Cassie McCarthy has lived with diabetes for the past four years. She has gone to Camp Diabest and found it to be a great experience. When I first went there, I didn't want no one to know that I was diabetic. And then I went there and I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of kids that have diabetes. I'm not the only one. So it helped a lot with that. She says that from her experience, Camp Diabest can be an expensive program. It costs a lot of money because there's a lot of campers and to feed them and to provide medicine because you don't have to bring your own medicine, they provide it for you. Dine Around Freddy runs from March 15th to March 31st. For more information, log on to www.tourismfredericton.ca. In Fredericton, Brad Perry, Community College News. March 14th is dedicated to our insatiable appetite for deep fried potato. It seems that the fat and salty snack is irresistible. Mike Trusiak reports on National Chip Day. Salt and vinegar, barbecue, and regular. When it comes to chips, there is no wrong way to make them or eat them. I usually mix them, the plain and the barbecue, and I eat. Sometimes it's nice just to sit down with a bottle of beer and a bag of chips and watch a movie or watch a show on TV and I do enjoy that in an evening, yeah. In Canada, 62% of our potatoes goes towards the production of potato chips. These salty snacks though may contain more than just sodium and empty calories. I know that some um, contain an extensive list of you know, MSG and then there's the canola oil and I have the issue with the GMO canola. Genetically modified organisms, GMO, include vegetables like potatoes that have been altered at the genetic level to help resist disease and grow faster. Despite this, people cannot seem to resist their temptation. Um, everything in moderation <laughs> would be my ultimate answer. Um, now, or look for a potato chip that doesn't have so many ingredients. Long-term effects of the consumption of GMOs in humans are not fully understood because of lack of long-term testing. In Woodstock, Mike Trusiak, Community College News. 
When we hear about a company striking, we may imagine picket lines and angry workers, but the loss of work and decreases in weekly wages has a big effect on a family. Jocelyn Turner finds out how a family can survive when on strike. A strike can mean a worker will be without work for weeks, maybe months. The public sees the frontline struggle, but what goes on in the lives and homes of the workers could come as a surprise. Jason Richard has been on strike for over three months. It sucks. You know, been uh, without a job now three months, uh, no way to pay the bills, uh, you know, help from family. Uh, it's very discouraging. For a normal week's work, Richard would earn around $650. His pay has been reduced to $150 a week, an average of $21 a day. He struggled so hard to uh, make a life for him and his kids and uh, to see him in the position where he uh, has to ask his parents to uh, help him keep his house, feed his kids. Richard is considering giving up her home in order to help her son. Paying two household bills has become too much for her. If worse comes to worse, I'll put my mini home up for sale and uh, pay the mortgage up there. Richard is grateful for all his mother has done to help him since he went on strike. He can't help but feel more stressed knowing where the help is coming from. It makes you feel horrible, you know, I'm 38 years old and uh, to be in this situation. Now I, you know, I held out as long as I could, but now I have to go out and find another job. Richard plans to look for a job because he sees no end in sight to the strike. But his mother's biggest fear is that he will have to leave the province and be separated from his children. In Shemaguy, New Brunswick, Jocelyn Turner, Community College News. Dr. Sergei Ivanchev came to Canada in 1992. Since his arrival, it has taken almost 20 years to return to his profession. Jillian Trainer has more. Dr. Ivanchev and his family are originally from Moldova. They came to Canada in 1992 on the way to what was supposed to be a vacation to Cuba. On the, our way to Havana, the plane stopped in Gander for refueling. We got off and uh, we remained there. After many years, he was able to get into residency in Canada, doing family medicine in Halifax and anesthesia in Kingston, Ontario. Eventually, he made his way to Woodstock, New Brunswick. When I left Moldova, I with Lucia and, and uh, our daughter, she was only a year and a half. A couple of years ago, Dr. Ivanchev started to write about his experiences. Those writings turned into the journey. And it's about uh, a sixth grader that uh, had a dream to come to see Canada. Ivanchev read chapters from his book and answered questions at the L.P. Fisher Public Library on February 21st. The reading packed the lower area of the library. The reception to the reading was very positive. People seem to really have a good time, enjoy it, and uh, I believe he did as well. I'm sure he inspired people who, who don't know his story. It's very much a story told from the heart. Um, and I think Dr. Ivanchev's personality comes through very strongly in the book. After the reading, Dr. Ivanchev signed copies of the book. After production costs, Dr. Ivanchev sends whatever profit he makes to a church in his hometown of Zarankutsa. The money goes toward repairs for the church. The roof is leaking, the, the windows are walled, and uh, it's quite uh, cold right now because it's winter, and uh, although it's not very cold in Moldova normally, this winter it's extremely cold. Ivanchev hopes his book can help the people in his hometown by repairing the church. In Woodstock, Jillian Trainer, Community College News. Video games have become a part of our culture. More people are picking up a controller and taking part in the virtual action. But some games have content that may not be appropriate for all ages. John Callen has more. Technology is evolving and so has the video game industry. The days of Mario smashing blocks and stomping turtles has given way to more violent content. The Electronic Software Ratings Board, ESRB, has taken a proactive approach to the industry by introducing a rating system for all video game content. Major retailers voluntarily follow these it's guidelines. Sure that, it's making sure that parents aren't walking out with games that aren't, they're, they're not suitable for their children. Like when one of the first questions we ask, like a parent that comes in there, how old are their children? Because that way they're not getting a mature rated game in the, like a six-year-old. Parents concerned about what content their children may be exposed to can rely on the rating system. I think it helps to make an informed decision when buying a game for your son or daughter, or even to let them play a game at their friend's house. 
For smartphone users, you now have the option of checking why a particular game has been given the rating that it has. Yes, there's an app for that. The ESRB app allows for consumers to speak, type, or scan the title of the game they wish to know more about. The app breaks down the nature of the rating to inform consumers what kind of content they will be exposed to. Parents like Smarten can be assured their future game purchases are age appropriate. In Fredericton, John Cowland, Community College News. St. Patrick's Day is not a holiday just for the Irish. This year's weekend event is bringing a little pot of gold to bar owners in the area. Ethan Hazlitt has more. St. Patrick's Day, a day to feast in remembrance of the Christian Saint Patrick who helped to bring Christianity to most of Ireland. For many though, it's just a day to celebrate. Maybe a reason to party? Just a reason to party. Well, I think it's a excuse to have a party. Basically, if you're not Irish. Yeah. St. Paddy's is not an official holiday, but many people still yep. celebrate the Irish tradition. This year, bar owners see St. Patrick's Day as a lucky break. Absolutely. If it's on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night, it is a lot busier. People want a, want a reason to go out and, and have a good time. During years when St. Patrick's Day falls on a night during the work week, bars and other establishments expect a small increase in business. Some bars serve traditional Irish brews and hope to stir up even more business. Yeah, anybody who doesn't mind food coloring in their beer will get a uh, draft, green draft. And we also have, have grasshoppers and the green jello shooters. Some think of the green themed occasion as an Irish only holiday and won't be going out. Not really. Don't really view it as a holiday, I guess. Not everyone likes to celebrate, but for people like Lasky, it's always a busy day. And in Charlottetown, if you're not in the bar on St. Patrick's Day, no, no matter what day of the week it is, you're not getting in. Any business loves to see a crowd of customers. And especially for bars, Lasky says the luck of the Irish can turn a slow day into a great one. In Woodstock, Ethan has the Community College News. That's our show for today. Send us your story ideas at jschoolmbcc at gmail.com. Or to see more of our work, visit jschoolmbcc.ca. Thanks for watching.